In this video I want us to look at the sons of God mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. Are they fallen angels or is this talking about the children of God in a spiritual sense? Let's look at Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 5. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. But the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them, wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became, might, became mighty men which were of old, men of renown, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, first things first, there is nothing to suggest that these beings are angelic at all in this context. In fact, the context argues against this interpretation. Just before Genesis chapter 6, we have Adam's lineage through Seth, laid out in chapter 5, and Cain's lineage in chapter 4. Let's look at that in Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. And he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And in contrast, let's look at the end of Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 to 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And then Genesis chapter 5 this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. We see that Cain went out from the presence of God, named his city after his son with no recognition of God, and contrary to this, Seth is considered by Adam to be his true seed, and Seth is made in the likeness of Adam, who is made in the likeness of God. And ultimately, when Seth starts having children, this is when men began to call upon the name of the Lord. These lineages, these two lineages, and their clear differences are placed back to back, to lead us into chapter 6. This is the context of the sons of God and the daughters of men. I personally feel, after prayer and study of these chapters, that this is enough information to come to the understanding that the sons of God are the sons of Seth, and the daughters of men are the daughters of those men outside of the presence of God, born of Cain. But I must be able to, de to debunk the supposedly good arguments for the opposing view that the sons of God are fallen angels. The most significant of which is the argument that the sons of God, or Ben Elohim in the Hebrew, means a direct creation of God, and therefore can only mean an angel, a being which is not generated through sexual means. The scripture used to justify this is from Job, chapter 38, Verses 4 and 6 to 7. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God here is referring to angels, clearly. But before we examine this argument of the sons of God any closer, let us first establish who the daughters of men are. We know that all men were producing female offspring, even though they are not specifically mentioned. 
The very start of chapter 6 makes this point. In verse 1 it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. If we are to discount this point, then we must wonder where Cain's wife and Cain's son's wives came from. Nonetheless, we know that daughters were being born, but remain, for the most part, unspecified in the lineages, with some minor exceptions. For instance, in Genesis 4, verse 32, sorry, 22, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. So, we have two ways of interpreting these verses, it seems. There is the godly lineage of men began to intermarry with ungodly women. Or, angels came to the earth to interbreed with women. To prove the first argument, we should see in the scriptures a continuous reproof of such intermarriages between godly people and the ungodly, between God's children and those who are not God's children. To prove the second argument, we should see in the scriptures some verse or verses to indicate that angelic beings are capable of procreation with physical beings. And this most shocking and terrible event in man's early history would be restated more clearly elsewhere in the Bible. So first of all, let's try to establish the second argument. Are there any verses in the scriptures teaching us that angels can generate offspring? No, not one. Verses which are used to justify this can also be found in Genesis, in chapter 19, when Lot convinces God's angels to stay in his home and they eat some bread, in verse 3, and when the debauched Sodomites attempt to rape the angels, in verse 5. The argument put forth is that if angels can eat and be raped, surely they can pass on DNA through sexual generation. Scripture is explicit about the fact that angels are capable of eating. The manna from heaven is even called angels' food. In Psalm 78, verse 25, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. As for rape... The angels were never raped, and so, as far as we know, the act itself is impossible. And even if it were possible, this doesn't conclude anything, actually. The intake of food, or being sexually abused, and having functioning sexual organs, are two very different matters. One is simply the act of processing matter, which is already in existence. The other is the creation of of biological matter in the form of semen containing, containing sperm capable of fusing with a woman's egg, carrying DNA, which is able to correspond with human DNA. Not to mention the fact that the angels would need to have a penis to deliver the semen appropriately. In actual fact, the verses from scripture relating to this matter seem to indicate that angels are not capable of procreation at all. I can understand why people would be inclined to believe that the sons of God means angels, because they believe that Satan was trying to pollute the human gene pool to prevent the Messiah from coming, that seed of the woman, as prophesied to Adam, Eve and Satan in Genesis 3. But we are consistently told that angels are spirit beings. In Hebrews 1, seven, And of the angels, he saith, who make of his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. And being spirits, they are not physical, and are certainly not capable of marrying and breeding with physical beings. Matthew 22.30, the Lord says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The context here, where the Lord is speaking, is of consummated marriages. Does this verse in Matthew indicate that angels possess the ability to consummate a marriage were they allowed to be married? 
Not at all. The Lord is indicating here that the Sadducees had a much too earthly interpretation of the nature of spiritual things. And as such, they did not understand that where spiritual beings are concerned, there is no need for sexual reproduction, and thus no need for sexual organs. As for Satan trying to pollute the human gene pool to prevent the Messiah from coming, whether they are the elect angels of 1 Timothy 5.21 or the evil angels of Psalm 78.49, none of them can do anything without God's allowance. People give too much credit to Satan, I'm afraid. Another verse used for this argument is from the context of Genesis 6. People look at verses 8 and 9 and say, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, people like Chuck Missler state that this means Noah's genetics had not been tampered with and polluted by the hybrid offspring of the fallen angels. But according to Strong's Concordance and other sources, the Hebrew word dore here means a revolution of time, or an age, or a generation. This means that Noah, being a man that walked with God, sought to obey God, having found grace in the eyes of the Lord, as we are told in verse 8. God, having had mercy upon him, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him to do. See verse 22. Noah undoubtedly was a man of God, filled with the spirit of Christ and looking forward to his day. A similar description is given for Job by God in Job chapter 1 verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? When we are told that Noah was perfect in his generations, this is saying nothing different than this verse in Job. There was none like Noah in the earth. He feared God. This is clearly not talking about Noah being a purely human child. That cannot be ascertained from the Hebrew or the context. I'm afraid it's just a, simply an uh, abuse of the translation of that English word there, generations. This is simply talking about Noah having been a saved man. As such, there is no way that this verse can be used to uphold the, the argument. It doesn't appear that there are any verses to uphold this second argument. What about the other ingredient then necessary to prove this argument? Are there any verses which restate this most horrific event in man's history when angels interbred with human women? No. This most incredible event of wickedness, worse than the sins of Sodom, is not expounded or repeated elsewhere in the Bible. The argument that would be employed at this stage is that it is implied in Jude. In Jude, verses 5 to 7, I will therefore, therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, Unto the day that sorry, unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They say, Look, the angels sinned, even as in verse seven, at the very beginning, even as. The Sodomites sinned by going after strange flesh. This cannot be ascertained by the context. These are two separate sentences in a list of examples of disobedience recounted from the Old Testament by Jude. The subject matter is disobedience. 
If we are to continue with this line of thinking, that this is simply talking about fornication and going after strange flesh, we must also assume that the Israelites, leaving Egypt, began to perform bestiality in the wilderness or something like that. But the context clearly does not allow this. No, I'm afraid this is a very flimsy argument. And just look at the parallel chapter from Second Peter to see that this argument holds no water. Second Peter 2 verses 4 to 6 For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the city the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Having established that we cannot justify the second argument from Scripture, now let us try contending for the first argument. Having established that the context declares there are two different lineages in Genesis 6, in two different relationships with God, all that one would need to do is show that there are continuous reproofs for the, throughout Scripture against the intermarriage of the godly and the ungodly. Those declared the children of God in Deuteronomy are told in chapter 7 verses 3 and 4, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. And isn't this exactly what we see in Genesis 6? People turning away, marrying ungodly people, and the Lord's anger being kindled, and a sudden destruction. Isn't that exactly what we see? And there are other classic examples of this. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 2 and verse 4, But King Solomon loved many strange women of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart, after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. But this was not the case with Noah. He was perfect in his generations, and did not turn away to ungodly women and their gods. Nehemiah looks back on the actions of King Solomon, and sees the damage that such intermarriages had done to his people. In chapter 13 of Nehemiah, verses 23 to 27, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? The argument here is that the sons of God did not consult the Lord, nor their apparently godly parents on the matter, but married wives, all of whom they chose. They chose their ungodly wives for themselves. Throughout the book of Genesis, we see that who one marries is of great importance, and more than this, the father will typically choose who his son will marry. For example, in Genesis chapter 24, verses 2 to 4, Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, 
that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And with Isaac's children, Jacob and Esau, there is also the same dilemma. In Genesis chapter 27, verse 46, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such, of, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do to me? That's just how grieving it was for them. And then in the next chapter, verses 6 and 8, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. I mean, in the next verse, verse 8, Esau sees that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. And we continue to see this rebuking of such behaviour throughout the Old Testament. God makes it clear that he does not want his holy seed mingling and marrying the ungodly. There is to be no intermarriage between the wheat and the tares. In Judges, we see exactly the same scenario in chapter 3, verses 5 and 7. Uh, the children of Israel uh, dwell among the Canaanites and all the other rites, and they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And of course, they, their hearts are turned away, and they begin to sin against God. And in Ezra, we see it yet again, but this time, God reveals to us something crucial about how he feels about this matter in verse 2 of chapter 9. Let's have a look at the first two verses of chapter 9. Again, we see the children of Israel amongst the Canaanites, all the other rites, the Egyptians. I mean, in verse 2, it is written, For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. We see quite clearly God does not want his holy seed, his children, to be mingling with unbelievers or the ungodly. But do we have a, a New Testament confirmation for this? Or is this simply just Old Testament language and we have the freedom now, we, we don't have to worry about things like this? No, the opposite is true. As the children of God in Christ, we are not to marry the ungodly. As the body of Christ, we are not to become one in marriage with anyone other than a member of Christ's body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 to 18, it is written, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This interpretation of who the sons of God are in Genesis 6 fits in perfectly with the rest of Scripture. Having to choose between fallen angels or God's children by the spirit of adoption I believe that the context makes it clear that the latter are being referred to. People like Chuck Missler might still say, but what about when the Lord Jesus says that in the last days it will be just like it was in Noah's time? Well, let's have a look at those verses. Luke 17, 26 to 29. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot. 
They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. These verses speak of people marrying and being given in marriage. But they don't say anything about angels having sexual intercourse with human women. And if they were supposed to have done so in Noah's day, does this mean that they were supposed to have done so in Lot's day? The Lord likens Lot's day to being exactly like Noah's day. But the scripture says nothing of this. The argument then would be that in today's culture, Western culture I suppose, we have so many films and TV shows depicting aliens coming from other planets to teach mankind or even to breed with mankind. And in fact there are TV shows and films depicting people falling in love with and breeding with angels. It is widely said by many Christians on the internet that what we are seeing come to pass is a diabolical end time trick in which Satan and his fallen angels will come to earth pretending to be aliens or something, having conditioned mankind to accept them as world leaders and they will again breed with human women. The secular world might be gripped with paganistic fables which they see on the big screen. They might be taken with the idea of demigods and superpowers just as every single pagan culture in human history has been. But simply because technology allows for this to be broadcast around the world with amazing special effects and with a frequency that shows Hollywood's desperate desire to cash in on whatever sells, does this mean that Satan is necessarily planning some big event which is nowhere mentioned in the Bible? Let's take a look at why people reach this conclusion. People say that UFO sightings and encounters have increased in the past 100 years or so, and they furthermore state that Christ prophesied of this in Luke 21, verses 25 and 27. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Where does the Lord speak of fallen angels here, let alone flying saucers? The people are fearful of the things coming on the earth. Now, the most we can ascertain from the context is that they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, and as we are told elsewhere in Scripture, he comes with his armies of angels, and there are those who cry out for the rocks to fall on them for fear of the Lamb's wrath. It seems as though adding an element about some UFO delusion is simply a presupposition, which in no way can be ascertained from the text itself. Whilst I believe that there are UFO encounters and people who are, to all experiential understanding, abducted by aliens, so-called, I believe these experiences are one of three things. It is either demonic, such as when New Agers claim that they are channeling certain beings from the Pleiades or wherever, and these beings are supposed to have travelled light years to come to the earth to help us in our spiritual evolution by, by giving us the cure for cancer? No, by teaching us the occult and telling us that Jesus wasn't really the, the divine Messiah and, depending on which alien you are supposed to be talking to, Jesus may or may not have died on the cross. And then Oprah Winfrey tells everyone how brilliant the book that was written as a result was. The second theory is that these experiences can also be purely delusional. People fooling others or themselves for the sake of having attention. And there's a third thing. Now this is particularly to do with when people see flying craft. There also may undoubtedly be genuine craft which were being developed by the Vatican-assisted Nazis during World War II. 
the Nazi rocket scientists developed several prototypes of saucer-type craft, and these very same scientists were absorbed as American citizens to keep their technology in Allied hands and out of the reach of the Soviets. This all took place during Operation Paperclip. Feel free to research that for yourself. Having become the founders of NASA, it seems perfectly plausible that these same scientists would have continued to develop secret aircraft for the US government. At no point, however, during these sightings of either craft or lights in the sky, hearing voices in your head when you play around with a Ouija board, whether natural or demonic, do we have a scripture in the Bible teaching us that fallen angels will come to earth to breed with human women? It must be understood that many take this interpretation in ludicrous directions by stating things like, when the Lord Jesus and John the Baptist say that the Pharisees are a brood of vipers and such, they are actually revealing the fact that the Pharisees are shape-shifting lizard men who are ruling the world on Satan's behalf and have continued to do so since they were called the seed of the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. This is clearly a fantastical absurdity. Logically speaking, if one detracts from the spiritual meaning of the Lord saying that the Pharisees are of their father the devil, one must also discount the spiritual meaning of being called the children of our Father in heaven. It will surprise you how many professing Christians believe in this lizard man theory. But the originator of this is really a man called David Icke, who is a New Ager who attacks the Bible and claims to be the Messiah. I don't really need to say any more on this point. Instead, what, according to Scripture, does the Lord Jesus mean when he speaks of our day being similar to Noah's day? 2 Peter 2.5 God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And what else does Peter say? In 1 Peter 3, 18-21, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also... He went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us, not putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the same spirit by which we are brought to spiritual life is the same spirit that preached through Noah to the wicked men before the flood, whose souls now await judgment and the lake of fire, having been dead in sin spiritually and now being physically dead. And what did the preaching of Noah and the very act of the flood signify? Salvation. The baptismal waters that cover the earth being symbolic of not just the putting off of the flesh, the old man, but also of being preserved in him alone, having nothing but the mercy of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and coming out of the ark, the baptismal waters, to a new covenant of mercy, having been kept from the wicked world and the certain judgment upon it. Truly, as it was in Noah's day, so it is in our day, these last days that the Lord Jesus said that we are in. The final point which we must deal with is the giants. Verse 4 of Genesis 6, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became, became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. 
People say that the sons of God must have been fallen angels because of the giant children that were born. This shows an obvious tampering with human DNA. Gigantism is a mutation of human genes that is naturally occurring since the fall of mankind and since death, decay and disorder have been imposed by God on his creation. To adopt the idea that these are the offspring of fallen angels, one must accept that the fallen, that the fallen angels sorry, came again and interbred with human women after the flood, as we are told that there were giants in those days, and also after that, after the flood, in which the supposedly genetically perfect Noah was the only man repopulating the planet. Therefore, the angels must have come again to breed with women. Otherwise, the human genealogy would be perfect, apparently. But is this second time where the angels come to breed with women mentioned in the scriptures? No. We can observe two things from these verses and from the natural world. Giants are spoken of in the scripture post-flood, such as Goliath, and gigantism is still a naturally occurring phenomenon today. Now, is there anything in these two pieces of information to give us cause to believe that fallen angels have had two major sessions of impregnating human women in human history and are planning a third? No. I would like to conclude, therefore, with a single verse from Paul's epistle to the Romans. Romans 8.14 For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Indeed, the sons of God are Ben Elohim, as the opposite argument would state. They are direct creations of God new creations even. We are born again, born of above. And this is entirely the work of God. Just as all of creation is his direct handiwork. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.